Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cutrate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the legendary Kaldeshi team-up, Rashmi and Raghavan. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see which commander we'll be covering next, who won last week's poll, and what commander you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Rashmi and Raghavan are a 2-4 monkey elf that cost 1, a green, a blue, and a red that have the following ability. Whenever we cast our first spell on each of our turns, we exile the top card of target opponent's deck and create a treasure token. We may then cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost if it's a spell of CMC less than the number of artifacts we control, and if we don't cast it this way, we may cast it this turn. Breaking down their core stats, Rashmi and Raghavan are sporting a mid-weight CMC, a low power stat block for their cost, and an ability that passively generates treasures for us and can potentially let us cast our opponent's spells off the top of their deck as we cast our own, possibly even for free depending on how many artifacts we have in play. But before we delve any deeper into this ability, it should be noted that, despite its somewhat confusing wording, this ability only applies on our turn, not each turn, meaning we'll only ever be getting one treasure and one potential spell per rotation. And when I say potential, I mean potential, since we'll usually have no information about our opponent's top deck when we select them, and we are restricted to casting those cards, not playing them. Meaning we can easily whiff if we hit lands, hit spells we don't want to cast, or just hit spells whose CMC is too high for us to cast. That said, to somewhat make up for this ability's lackluster accuracy, if we do hit a spell we can and want to cast, Rashmi and Raghavan give us the opportunity to do so at no cost if we have enough artifacts in play, with them generously providing us with an extra artifact before they check for this in the form of treasure. And in the event we can't cast it for free due to us not having enough artifacts in play, or simply hitting an X spell that we don't want to cast for X equals zero, they also give us a second opportunity to hard cast that spell before the end of the turn, with the treasure they provide us with helping us pay for any mana outside of our slice of the color pie if we have to do so. So, based on their abilities, Rashmi and Raghavan appear to be a commander that care about artifacts to enable their spell theft, aiming to get lots of artifacts onto the battlefield so they can eventually cast any spells they hit off our opponent's decks for free as we cast our own spells. There are a few issues with this, however, such as their ability only being limited to our turn, not procking on the turn that they come down, and potentially missing entirely by hitting a land or a spell that we can't or don't want to cast. So in this build, we'll be concentrating on improving this ability as much as we can, aiming to improve its accuracy, the frequency that we can use it, and maximizing the chances for us to cast the spells we hit off it for free. On the accuracy side of things, we'll be running a fair number of ways for us to repeatedly peek at some or all of our opponent's top decks to take the guesswork out of who to target, as well as ways for us to clear their top decks of cards we don't want, and or set up their top decks with cards we do want so we can steal them later. Then moving on to ways to improve this ability's frequency, we'll be slotting in both means to copy our commander's ability as it resolves, as well as ways to just copy our commander via non-legendary copy effects and clones, thereby ensuring we can proc it more often if we're just using it blindly, or be able to cherry pick the best cards off our opponents if we do have their top deck information. And then to improve the rate that we're able to cast these spells at no cost, we'll be running a wide variety of artifact token generators, mostly comprised of treasure, clues, and food, which we can stockpile in the early game to enable our commander, and then later use to generate us value either through their own effects, or through various artifact payoffs that we'll be running alongside them to turn them into even more value or into damage. And lastly, since we'll be running a lot of top deck focused and ability copying effects anyway, we'll be running a handful of other sources of spell stealing effects to work alongside our commander or to be used in her stead if she becomes indisposed, enabling us to continue stealing our opponent's resources until they inevitably fall to their deck's own design. 
So let us make our way to Kaladesh, where we'll find our odd commander team up locked in combat against the Phyrexians. One a gifted elven Aether Seer who's fighting for her home and everything she holds dear, and the other a thieving pirate monkey that steals everything that's not nailed down. But though their reasons to fight may differ, they share the love of their homeland, its people, and its treasures. Though mostly the latter, in Raghavan's case, much to Rashmi's annoyance. So they'll fight until their last breath to defend their home. And Ravagan will certainly run off with the loot if they survive. So, now that we know a bit more about the commander and playstyle, let's start looking at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Beginning in the CMC1 slot, we have its singular entrant, Gilded Goose, a 0-2 flyer that creates a food token when it ETBs and lets us either pay one a green and tap it to create a food token, or tap it and sack a food token to generate a mana of any color making it a decent early drop that helps build up our artifact count to enable our commander spell theft that we can later use to get even more artifacts into play or to fix our mana if we find ourselves having to hard cast our opponent's spells. It's then on to the CMC2 slot, which opens with a legendary entrance, Lunas Cryptozoologist and Magda Brazen Outlaw. Lunas is a 1-2 that, whenever another non-token creature ETBs under our control, creates a clue token, and we can tap and sack X clue tokens to reveal the top X cards of target opponent's deck, putting a non-land permanent from among them of CMC X or less into play under our control, and sending the rest to the bottom of their deck in a random order. This time providing us with a steady stream of clues as we summon both our own and our opponent's creatures that we can then use to either generate card advantage with their own ability, or instead use to fuel Lunas' ability and steal even more of our opponent's spells. Magda is a 2-1 that gives all other dwarves we control plus 1 plus 0, creates a treasure token whenever a dwarf we control becomes tapped, and lets us sack 5 treasures to search our deck for an artifact or dragon and put it into play who we'll be playing primarily for her last ability so that we can turn our treasures into a tutor for multiple payoffs and enablers in this build. Though if we do drop her early enough, she can generate a few extra treasures for us to both enable herself and our commander. Then as our last creature in the CMC2 slot, we have Reckless Fireweaver, a 1-3 that, whenever an artifact ETBs under our control, deals 1 damage to each opponent, weaponizing our final build's impressive amount of artifact token creation by turning them into AoE burn as we create them to soften up and or finish off our opponents while we're casting their spells. The CMC3 slot's first two entries, Ingenious Artillerist and Hedron Detonator, then continue on the Artifact Burn game plan. The former being a 3-1, that, whenever one or more artifacts ETB under our control, deals that much damage to each opponent, and the latter being a 2-3 that deals one damage to target opponent whenever an artifact ETBs under our control instead, as well as letting us tap it and sack two artifacts we control to exile the top card of our deck, letting us play that card that turn. Again, giving us more means to turn our artifact token creation into burn to whittle away at our opponent's life totals, with the latter also letting us turn our spare artifact tokens into impulse draw as needed. Speaking of artifact token creation, we have a pair of red treasure generating creature entries then up next with Pain Distributor and Professional Facebreaker. Pain Distributor is a 2-3 with Menace that, whenever a player casts their first spell each turn, has them create a treasure token, and, whenever an artifact an opponent controls is sent to the graveyard from the battlefield, they take 1 damage, giving us additional treasure generation as we cast our first spell each turn to increase our artifact count even further, and while it will be doing the same for our opponents, it at least forces them to take damage to make use of that treasure in the first place. Professional Facebreaker is another 2-3 with Menace that, whenever one or more creatures we control deal combat damage to a player, creates a treasure token. In addition to letting us sack a treasure token to exile the top card of our deck and letting us play that card until the end of the turn, taking advantage of this build's decent number of evasive bodies to get us even more treasure into play and even letting us turn our spare treasure into impulse draw if needed. Then switching from red to green token generators, we have Tireless Provisioner and a Tireless Tracker, each of which are three twos that create an artifact token whenever a land ETB is under our control, the former creating either a treasure or a food token, and the latter creating a clue token instead, in addition to gaining a plus one plus one counter whenever we sacrifice a clue, making them both steady streams of artifact token generation as we make our land drops to enable our commander, and providing us with ramp, life gain, and or card advantage as needed. 
And then reaching the end of the CMC3 slot, we have its last two entrants, Academy Manufactor and Zorn. Academy Manufactor is a 1-3 that, whenever we would create a clue, food, or treasure token, has us create one of each instead, taking full advantage of our wide array of token generators to give us three tokens for the price of one whenever we proc or activate them, and making it that much easier to get free spells off our commander while giving us access to even more ramp, draw, and life gain as well. Zorn is a 3-2 that, whenever we would create one or more treasure tokens, has us create that many plus one instead, this time getting us more treasures into play as we create them, which shouldn't be an issue considering that treasures are the most common type of token we produce, helping us ramp even harder while again maximizing the odds of Rashmi and Raghavan casting our opponent's spells for free, and in the event that they still can't, at least makes hard casting those spells easier. The CMC4 slot is then up next, bringing with it even more artifact token generation with its first trio of entrants, Ethereal Investigator, Schema Thief, and Jolene the Plunder Queen. Ethereal Investigator is a 2-3 flyer that, when it ETBs, creates X clue tokens, where X is equal to the number of opponents we have, and, whenever we draw our second card each turn, creates a 1-1 flying creature token, generally getting us 3 clues when it comes down to build up our artifact count quickly, and then helping us build up our board with evasive bodies as we crack those clues to draw cards on both our and our opponent's turns. Schema Thief is a 3-3 flyer that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, creates a token copy of target artifact that player controls, making it a repeatable way for us to get copies of our opponent's best rocks, utility artifacts, and artifact creatures for ourselves that is very easy to trigger thanks to its built-in evasion. Jolene is a 2-2 that, whenever a player attacks one or more of our opponents, has that player create a treasure token. Whenever we would create one or more treasure tokens, has us create that many plus one instead, and lets us sack five treasures to put five plus one plus one counters on her. Like Zorn before her, helping us improve our treasure generation with her mere presence on the battlefield, on top of actually generating treasures for us as we swing into our opponents and becoming a gigantic beat stick if we have the treasure to spare. Then as we pass this slot's halfway mark, we have a pair of top deck focused creatures joining our ranks, those being Wizened Snitches and Cutthroat Negotiator. Wizened Snitches is a 1-3 flyer that has players play with a top card of their deck revealed, providing us with perfect top deck information to maximize our commander's ability as soon as it comes down, ensuring that we'll not only never miss, but also hit the best options every time. Cutthroat Negotiator is a 4-3 that, whenever it attacks, has each player reveal the top card of their deck, creating a tapped treasure token for each non-land card revealed, then has each player draw a card, which, when working in conjunction with information granting sources like the previous entry, can clear our opponent's top decks of cards we don't want to hit and replace them with something that's hopefully better, while simultaneously allowing us to stockpile treasures in the process. Then, as our last entry in this slot, we have the legend Sakashima the Imposter, a 3-1 who, when he ETBs, has us choose a creature in play and lets him come into play as a copy of that creature. Except his name is still Sakashima the Imposter, he's still legendary, and he lets us pay 2 and double blue to return him to our hand at the end of the turn. The fact that he keeps his own name, allowing us to use him as a copy of Rashmi and Raghavan without breaking the legendary rule, thereby allowing us to make use of her ability more often, and his self-bounce, while it won't be saving him from removal, does give us the option to reset him so we can copy other powerful creatures that we have in the 99 or that we've stolen from our opponents. Creatures like Itali Primal Storm, for example, as we skip to the CMC6 slot. A 6-6 six -six that, whenever he attacks, exiles a top card of each player's deck and lets us cast any spells from among them at no mana cost. Providing our build with another means to cast our opponent's spells alongside our commander that coincidentally can also make very good use out of the ability copying, non-legendary clones, and top deck information gathering slash manipulation that we're already running to enable them. We then have Brutaclad, a Telcor Engineer, joining us as we reach this slot's halfway mark. A 4-4 that grants all tokens we control haste, and, at the beginning of combat, creates a 2-1 artifact creature token, and then gives us the option to turn all our tokens into a copy of a token we control, giving us a free artifact body per rotation, and not only a means to turn all our artifact tokens into the same kind of token, typically treasures to ramp us, but also as a way for us to use non-legendary token copies of our commander to flood the board with an instant army of Rashmi and Raghavans should the opportunity present itself. 
And then as our final entry in this slot, we have Shimmer Dragon, a 5-6 flyer who gains Hexproof if we control 4 plus artifacts and lets us tap 2 artifacts we control to draw a card. Making it an artifact payoff that usually comes into play being untargetable thanks to our artifacts and artifact tokens that we can then use to turn those same artifacts into repeatable instant speed card advantage, all while being a huge evasive beat stick to boot. And finally, reaching the CMC7 slot, our first of two creatures to cap off this category is Junkwinder, a 5-6 with affinity for tokens that, whenever a token ETBs under our control, taps down target non-land permanent and opponent controls and prevents it from untapping on their next untap step. At worst, giving us a pseudo-stun 1 alongside our commander every rotation to lock down the biggest threat at the table, but with multiple sources of artifact token generators in play can easily shackle down entire boards. And then as our last creature entry, we have the legend Itali Primal Conqueror, whose front face is a 7-7 Trampler that, when he ETBs, has each player exile a top card of their deck until they exile a non-land card and lets us cast any cards exiled this way without paying their mana cost, and for 9 and a Phyrexian Green, transforms into Atali Primal Sickness at sorcery speed. An 11-11 Trampler with Indestructible that, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, gives them that many poison counters. His front face giving our build yet another way for us to cast our opponent's spells that is guaranteed to hit 4 spells that we're able to cast, and, should we need to, we can transform him into an even bigger, highly resilient and poison delivering threat that is more than capable of one-shotting our opponents that can't block him, and usually two-shotting them even if they can. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Jumping straight into the CMC2 slot, its first half brings us some spell disruption in the form of counter spell and memory lapse, both of which counter target spell, with the latter returning that spell to the top of its owner's deck, providing our build with very cheap interaction we can use to disrupt our opponent's plays or protect our own, with the latter even setting up our opponent's top deck for us with whatever bomb we counter with it so we can take it for ourselves. We then have even more removal being added to our arsenal with the second half of this slot's entrance, Expel from Araska and Reality Shift. The former returning target non-land permanent to its owner's hand, or, if we control 10 plus permanents, to the top of its owner's deck instead, and the latter exiling target creature and then having that creature's owner manifest the top card of their deck, at base making them passable removal options, but really shining in this build thanks to being able to set up and or clear an opponent's top deck to further enable our commander's spell theft. The CMC3 slot then stays on the top deck manipulation bandwagon with its first entrant, Hinder, which counters target spell then lets us put it either on top or at the bottom of its owner's deck, again giving us another means to impede our opponent's plays while enabling our own via setting up their top deck. Then switching gears to some more generic removal, we'll be running both Beast Within and Chaos Warp, both of which target a permanent, the former destroying it and giving its owner a 3-3 to replace it, and the latter shuffling it back into its owner's deck and then having them reveal the top card from it, letting them put it into play if it's a permanent, making them both incredibly flexible removal options whose downsides are well worth putting up with considering the wide array of threats they can deal with, with the latter's downside even occasionally providing us with top deck information if our our opponent can't put the revealed card into play. Then skipping to the CMC5 slot and our final trio of instants, we have access denied, spell swindle, and confirm suspicions, all of which counter target spell and either create 1-1 one, one flying thopter tokens equal to the countered spell CMC, create treasure tokens equal to its CMC instead, or creates 3 clue tokens, all of them admittedly being incredibly expensive counter spells, but our high amount of treasure generation and other ramp sources help take the edge off allowing us to further hamper our opponent's plays while getting a moderate to large amount of artifacts into play as we do so. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Moving straight into the CMC2 slot, we open with its lone entry, Rise and Shine, which has target non-creature artifact we control become a 0-0 artifact creature with 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters, and that we can overload for 4 in double blue, which will of course always be overloading to animate all our artifact tokens, artifact lands, and utility artifacts to, hopefully, end the game on the spot with our instant army. Then skipping over to the CMC4 slot, Erencius' Vile Duplication joins us as its singular member, which creates a token copy of target creature we control, except it has flying and isn't legendary. 
giving us yet another way to double up on our commander's ability by getting an extra copy of them into play, or alternatively, that we can use to get a copy of any of our other spell-stealing creatures and or any powerful threats we steal off our opponents. We'll then proceed to the CMC5 slot, where Thought, Cast, and Reverse Engineer will be joining us as some artifact-themed draw sources. The first drawing us two cards and having affinity for artifacts, and the second drawing us three cards and having improvise. Generally only costing us one or two mana respectively, thanks to our artifacts being able to reduce and or pay for their costs, which is a fantastic rate for this artifact-heavy build. Then jumping all the way to the CMC9 slot, we have our final sorcery entry, Blasphemous Act, which costs one less to cast for each creature on the battlefield and deals 13 damage to each creature. Serving as a deceptively cheap wipe that we can often use to level the board for a single mana to let us start rebuilding immediately if things get too out of hand. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Leaping right into the CMC3 slot, we open with a pair of green artifact token generators in the form of Fey Offering and Killer Service. Fey Offering, on each end step, if we cast both a creature and non-creature spell that turn, creates a clue, a food, and a treasure. Its condition being easily met by a relatively balanced amount of creatures and non-creature spells, supplemented by those we steal off our opponents, to provide us with a steady stream of artifacts at least once per rotation to further enable our commander, while providing us with additional card advantage, ramp, and life gain. Killer Service, when it ETBs, creates X food tokens, where X is equal to the number of opponents we have, and, on our end step, lets us pay 2 and sack a token to create a 4-4 creature token, initially giving us 3 artifacts into play for 3 mana, which is superb for increasing the maximum CMC of spells we can cast off our opponents for free, and later gives us the means to weaponize our tokens by turning them into decent sized bodies if we have the spare mana, which is a nice option to have if we have more tokens than we know what to do with. And then closing out this slot, we have Game Preserve, which, at the beginning of our upkeep, has each player reveal the top card of their deck, and, if they're all creatures, puts them into play under their owner's control, usually serving as another way for us to passively gain information of what's on top of our opponent's decks, as it is somewhat unlikely that the entire table will have creatures as their top deck, but even if we do hit all creatures, we'll still most likely be either getting additional token generators to enable our commander further, or a payoff for all our artifacts and artifact tokens, so we'll still take it. And lastly, reaching the CMC4 slot and our final enchantment, we have Thopter Spy Network, which, on our upkeep, if we control an artifact, creates a 1-1 flying artifact creature token, and, whenever one or more artifact creatures we control deal combat damage to a player, draws us a card, making it a very easy to enable source of passive artifact tokens that we can then use alongside our other evasive artifacts to continually replenish our hands. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Beginning with the CMC1 slot, we'll start off with the Mana Rock Soul Ring, which taps for two colorless, which of course will be running in this build to help us get to our higher CMC spells faster, as well as to contribute to our artifact count to enable our commander. Then closing out this slot, we'll be running a pair of game plan specific entries, namely Lantern of Insight and Giant's Amulet. Lantern of Insight has each player play with the top card of their deck revealed, and lets us tap it and sack it to have target player shuffle their deck, providing the build with some free top deck information gathering that this time also contributes to us casting those spells for free, making it a near perfect addition to the build. Giant's Amulet is an equipment that equips for 2, gives the equipped creature plus 0 plus 1 in addition to Hexproof so long as it's untapped, and lets us pay an additional 3 and a blue as we cast it to create a 4-4 token that it then attaches to, which will be primarily running for the cheap targeting protection it provides, since our commander does take a full rotation to get their ability online, and our opponents will likely exploit that to prevent us from using it, especially if we're ahead on board or have ways to copy it. It's then on to the CMC2 slot, which leads off with our Mana Rock collection consisting of Arcane Signet, which taps for any color in our commander's color identity, Gruel Signet, Izzet Signet, and Simic Signet, which let us pay one and tap them for two out of three of our colors, Talisman of Creativity and Talisman of Curiosity, which either tap for our colorless or instead tap for one of two of our colors if we take a damage, and Felwar Stone, which taps for any color an opponent's land would be able to produce. 
all of which cheaply and efficiently speed up and or fix our mana base, while again, by virtue of being artifacts, help enable Rashmi and Ravagan spell theft by making it more likely for us to cast the spells they steal for free. Then pivoting from ramp to protection, we'll be running both Swiftfoot Boots and Nurok Stealth Suit as equipment to further increase our commander's resilience, both of which equip for one, with the former granting the equipped creature hexproof and haste, while the latter grants it shroud instead and can be attached at instant speed for double blue, making it that much harder for our opponents to remove our commander once we've set them up, and, if they're already protected, we can instead use to protect our other spell-stealing creatures, Rashmi's clones, or any bombs we steal off our our opponents. And lastly, to close out the CMC2 slot, we'll be running Stryonic Resonator, Idol of Oblivion, and Wand of Denial. Stryonic Resonator lets us pay to and tap it to copy triggered ability we control, providing us with a simple, no-nonsense way to double up on our commander's ability, and, since it doesn't target the creature, bypasses targeting prevention effects like Shroud if necessary. Idol of Oblivion lets us tap it to draw a card if we created a token that turn, in addition to letting us pay 8, tap it, and sack it to create a 10-10 creature token, which alongside our commander nets us a free draw per rotation so long as we cast a spell, and, in the late game, gives us the option to crack it for a 10-10 token instead if we need the additional board presence. Wand of Denial lets us tap it to look at the top card of target opponent's deck, and then, if it's a non-land card, gives us the option to pay two life to send that card to their graveyard, granting us another manaless way for us to repeatedly peek at an opponent's top deck to see if they're worth targeting with our commander that turn, or, at worst, at least eliminating them as an option. The significantly smaller CMC3 slot is then up next, containing only two entries, Chaos Wand and Inspiring Statuary. Chaos Wand lets us pay for and tap it to have target player exile cards off the top of their deck until they exile an instant or sorcery, then lets us cast that card at no mana cost and sends the rest to the bottom of their deck in a random order, serving as another means for us to cast our opponent's spells to work alongside our commander, which again gets better thanks to our various sources of top deck information gathering and manipulation. Inspiring Statuary gives all non-artifact spells we control improvise, allowing us to turn all our artifacts and artifact tokens into mana rocks to help us cast over a third of our deck, speeding up our mana base considerably and not costing us any resources to do so. The CMC4 slot then brings us its trio of game plan enabling artifacts, Helm of the Host, Lithoform Engine, and Wand of Wonder. Helm of the Host is an equipment that equips for 5, and, at the beginning of combat on our turn, creates a non-legendary copy of the equipped creature and grants it haste, enabling us to create an ever-growing number of Rashmi and Raghavans to steal more and more spells off our opponents, or alternatively, we can use to get extra permanent copies of any of our opponent's creatures that we're able to steal that stick around even after they've been eliminated. Lithoform Engine either lets us pay 2 and tap it to copy target activated or triggered ability we control, pay 3 and tap it to copy an instant or sorcery we control, or pay 4 and tap it to copy target permanent spell we control, which we'll mostly be playing as another copy of Stryonic Resonator to get extra uses out of our commander's spell theft, but its ability to copy most of our other spells as well as those we hit off our opponents still being very useful if the opportunity presents itself. Wand of Wonder lets us pay 4 and tap it to roll a d20 and have each opponent exile the top card of their deck until they exile an instant or sorcery, shuffling the rest back into their deck. On a result of 1 through 9, we can cast one of those spells, on a result of 10 through 19, we can cast two, and on a nat 20, we can cast all three, making it a slightly more expensive Chaos Wand 45% of the time and a strict upgrade to it 55% of the time, with the added benefit of clearing all our opponent's top decks if we're able to see them and don't want any of them. And lastly, reaching the CMC5 slot and our final proper artifact entry of the list, we have Tamiyo's Journal, which, on our upkeep, creates a clue token, in addition to letting us tap it and sack three clue tokens to let us search our deck for any card and add it to our hand, giving us one last source of passive token creation that, if we're stockpiling them, which we should be doing anyway to enable our commander, we can cash in for a manaless tutor to fetch up any of our clones and ability copying effects to get even more mileage out of our commander. That covers all our artifacts, and since we have no planeswalkers to cover in this build, let's move straight into our land base. 
Quickly running down our mana lands, we have Command Tower, Frontier Bivouac, and Path of Ancestry, all of which tap for all our colors to improve consistency, Exotic Orchard, which can tap for most if not all our colors off our opponent's lands since we're a three color deck, and the Reveal Lands Frostboil Snarl, Game Trail, and Vine Glimmer Snarl, which function as dual lands in this build that will usually come into play untapped thanks to our relatively large number of basics. Then moving on to our Artifact Lands, we'll be running the OG Artifact Lands, Great Furnace, Seed of Synod, and Tree of Tales, the Indestructible Colorless Generating Land, Dark Steel Citadel, and the Slow but Dual Mana Generating and Still Indestructible Silver Bluff Bridge, Slagwoods Bridge, and Tangle Pool Bridge, all of which are fantastic in this build just by virtue of being artifacts in our land slot that contribute towards Rashmi and Ravagon's ability to cast free spells off our opponents. And then as our one and only utility land, we have Moonring Island, which comes into play tapped, taps for a blue, and, if we control 2 plus blue permanence, lets us pay a blue and tap it to look at the top card of target player's deck, serving as one final way for us to stack the odds in our favor when using our commander's ability, this time from the convenience of our land slot. And finally, we'll be running 7 islands, 7 mountains, and 7 forests as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 24 creatures including the Commander, 10 Instants, 5 Sorceries, 4 Enchantments, 21 Artifacts, 0 Planeswalkers, and 36 Lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 29 cards that are considered artifacts, 22 sources of artifact tokens, 8 cards that care about artifacts, 15 cards that either let us see or manipulate our opponent's top deck, 2 ways to copy triggered abilities, 3 ways to create non-legendary copies of creatures, and 3 sources of targeted removal protection giving us a massive amount of artifacts to ensure that we'll be casting most of our opponent's spells for free, some payoffs to go with those artifacts to provide us with additional value, and plenty of ways for us to get the maximum mileage out of our commander's ability by gathering info or manipulating our opponent's top deck, getting extra activations out of their ability via either copying it or creating clones of them, and or just by keeping them alive long enough to ensure that they can continue to use their ability throughout the course of the game. For general deck stats, we have 21 ramp sources, 15 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 1 board wipe. Our ramp and draw being well above average in this build due to our clue and treasure generation, which we're using to contribute to our artifact count, while our targeted removal and wipes fall within more typical numbers. Then looking at our mana curve, we have 4 1 drops, 22 drops, 16 3 drops, 12 4 drops, 6 5 drops, 3 6 drops, 2 7 drops, and 1 9 drop, leaving us with a mid-weight curve that aims to get our commander online quickly, hopefully alongside artifacts and artifact token generators to get the spell stealing game plan rolling as fast as possible. Then from there, it's just a matter of getting more artifacts into play to maximize our chances of casting the spells we steal for free, using top deck information gathering and manipulation to improve our spell thievery's accuracy, and employing cloning and ability copying effects to have Rashmi and Ravagon spell theft proc more often, until our opponents fall under the combined weight of their own spells and our artifacts. This deck is currently valued at 6514, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Tamiyo's journal can be exchanged for Teferi Timeless Voyager, who still provides us with draw, sets up an opponent's top deck with his removal, and even has a player-specific pseudo-wipe via his ultimate, though we will be missing out on the artifact tokens and eventual tutoring of his predecessor. Blasphemous Act can be traded out for Double Major if we want yet another way to get extra non-legendary tokens of our commander into play, though it will leave us entirely relying off our opponent's wipes if we want to clear the board and Itali Primal Conqueror's powerful spell stealing and eventual game-ending poison distribution can be substituted for Cyber Drive Awakener, which gives us another means to weaponize our artifact tokens instead of relying so heavily off of what we hit off our opponent's decks. Then for upgrades, Ethereal Investigator can be benched for Spark Double to give us another simple but effective non-legendary clone to get us more copies of our commander into play, 
Access Denied can be replaced with Goldspan Dragon to generate us even more treasure tokens, and make those we already have in play be worth twice as much mana when we crack them, and Cutthroat Negotiator can be sidelined to make room for Urza Lord High Artificer, who turns all our artifacts and artifact tokens into mana rocks, and then can use the mana they produce to cast cards off the top of our deck to ensure not a single pip of that mana goes to waste. And finally, for those with the deepest pockets, we can sideline Lunas Cryptozoologist and give his spot to the fantastic treasure generator Dockside Extortionist, which can reliably generate us double-digit treasures when it comes down for just shy of the price of this entire deck, or we can instead consider cutting Game Preserve for the cheaper and more accurate top deck information gatherer Field of Dreams. Though I do mean cheaper mana-wise in this case, since we'll need to dole out some serious treasures of our own if we want to include this reserve list member in our arsenal. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Before we continue, I would first like to give a quick thanks to all the channel subscribers for having helped us reach the 12.1k subscriber milestone. Thank you all for your continued support, as we would not have gotten here without it. Now, with the Rashmi and Raghavan build covered, the next commander we'll be covering will be the gigantic team-up pairing consisting of Yargol and Multani. So look forward to a build using and abusing their massive 18 power coming next week. Then moving on to the results of last week's poll, it looks like in the Battle of the Completed Commanders, a Yara Widow of the Realm claimed the top spot, so we'll be seeing a sack-heavy build featuring her coming soon. Then proceeding to this week's poll, we'll be pivoting back to team-up commanders to continue the fight against the Phyrexians, with this week's contenders being Erent and Giada from Nuka Pena, Jeru and Hazaret from Amonkhet, and Inga and Eska from Kaldheim. So please cast your votes in the community tab, link in the description, before the deadline on May 12th, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders from March of the Machine you want to see me cover in future polls. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And speaking of which, I would like to thank Soichiro for their generous donation. Thanks for the coffee, Soichiro, and thank you for supporting the channel. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.